Uh, uh, the speaker has uh, 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 agreed to take questions during the talk. There will be no Q and A after the talk. So if you have questions or comment, please uh, uh, unmute yourself. Or if you rather write questions in the chat box, uh, please do so. I'll try to pay attention to the chat and then call them out. Okay, so uh, please start. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to speak here. So I will speak about uh, quaternionic scalar manifolds, uh, which is the uh, scalar geometry of n equal to uh, supergravity coupled to hypermultiplets. So this is a, a physical motivation to consider uh, such geometries, but it's also interesting from a mathematical point of view, and I will focus on some mathematical properties of examples. Okay. Oops. Okay, yeah, so you now it works. So let me first recall what is the quaternionic Kähler manifold. So this is uh, precisely the analog of the notion of a Kähler manifold. If you replace the complex structure by a quaternionic structure. So the precise definition is that there exists a parallel and skew-symmetric almost quaternionic structure on, on a Riemannian manifold. So you have a, a Riemannian metric G here, for, uh, to exclude some special cases, we assume that the scalar curvature is non-zero. And then the assumption is just that you are given such uh, parallel skew-symmetric almost quaternionic structure. This definition is uh, very good in uh, dimensions eight and higher, but in four dimensions, it is uh, not sufficient. So in four dimensions, you need to add uh, some additional conditions to obtain the definition of a quaternionic Keller manifold. So for completeness, I also mentioned the four-dimensional uh, case. I have a, a, a problem in um, switching to the next uh, page, so I don't know why. Uh, if you do, if you quit non-screen mode, uh, even though it shows border, but it might you might be able to handle that better. Uh -huh. Okay. This happens often if you use full screen mode, so you can just quit the mode. Yeah, but even the escape is not, ah, now the escape is working. Yeah, so it's not very convenient. So it's the first time I have this problem. Okay, let, let me try. But I suppose you can just scroll this through. Yeah. I, I, we can read your slide very uh, okay with this, in this way. If we, if we just scroll through it. So let, let me try another, oops, sorry. Yeah, so scrolling uh, works nice now. Okay, so this, this was the definition of a quaternionic Kähler uh, manifold. So in four dimensions, it's just a half conformally flat Einstein manifold. And half conformally flat means that half of the vial tensor vanishes. And so uh, some well-known facts about uh, quaternionic Kähler manifolds is that they are Einstein and the holonomy group is a subgroup of the group SPN times uh, SP1 where sp1 is the uh, usual notation for the group of unit quaternions acting on a quaternionic vector space, and spn is its normalizer in the uh, uh, orthogonal group in 4n real variables. So up to homotherapy, um, it's known that there are only finitely many complete quaternionic scalar manifolds of positive scalar curvature, so we can distinguish positive and negative scalar curvature, and in positive scalar curvature, it's known that there are only finitely many in every dimension, but these finitely many examples are possibly not all known. So there's a conjecture that these uh, finitely many examples should be exhausted by the uh, quaternionic Kähler symmetric spaces of compact type. So this is the uh, uh, lebron salomon conjecture, but a priori there might be more, uh, but only a finite number of uh, examples in every uh, dimension. For negative scalar curvature, the situation is completely uh, different. So we know for a long time, so the first examples were already constructed in the 70s um, by uh, Alexievsky. So we know that there are um, many examples of complete uh, quaternionic Kähler manifolds of negative uh, scalar curvature. Uh, but still, uh, we don't know any examples uh, which are compact or more generally of finite volume other than locally symmetric spaces. So this is the state of the art 
uh, today that all known examples uh, of finite volume are locally symmetric. So they are of uh, either uh, two types. So they are either symmetric spaces of compact type. These are of course compact or they are quotients of symmetric spaces of non-compact type. So where you take a non-compact space and then divide by a co-compact uh, lattice. And so this exhausts all known examples um, until today. And uh, so this should be compared with the situation for other holonomy groups from Berger's list. So you may know that um, Marcel Berger classified the um, possible holonomy groups of Riemannian manifolds. So these are the groups uh, generated by parallel transport along uh, closed loops in the Riemannian manifold based at some uh, base point. And uh, the surprising thing is that uh, the list of such groups is rather small if you exclude all groups which come from symmetric spaces. So you have the classification of symmetric spaces and there you can easily determine the holonomy group for each of these examples. And there are many uh, such uh, holonomy groups and they occur in infinite series. But if you exclude these known examples, then the remaining possible holonomy groups form a very short list. And each of these uh, groups is very well known to mathematicians and physicists alike. So they include such groups like SUN, which defines the uh, Calabiao manifolds, like SPN hyperkähler manifolds, and also G2 and SPIN7, which define exotic uh, holonomies. And for each of these groups, there are, uh, by now, we have uh, compact examples. So these are due to Yao, Boville, and Joyce in the Ritchie flat case, so for, for all these uh, examples. So, so the only case which remains open uh, with respect to this problem is really the group SP1 times SPN. And so there has been no uh, example uh, until now. And uh, there we only have these conjectures, or at least for positive scalar curvature, we have a conjecture. For negative, there's not even a conjecture. And so the problem is to um, know if there are complete non-locally symmetric quaternionic Keller manifolds of finite volume or more generally with an end uh, of finite volume. I think this is also interesting in the context of the swampland where there are conjectures about um, scale effective field theories and the geometry thereof, so some uh, uh, conditions which say that the space should be non-compact and of finite volume. So of course, it would be interesting to know if, for instance, with this kind of scalar geometry, is it, it is uh, possible to have examples of finite volume which are not already uh, locally symmetric. So here's a construction. So we have a, a construction to propose. And so I will explain the different steps of the construction and then um, go through the steps in a series of examples. So show that all these steps can in fact be uh, realized. So the um, idea is to start simply with a quaternionic Kähler symmetric space of non-compact types. So these are the very well known uh, spaces and we know that they have compact uh, quotients. So this is due to Borel. So where gamma is a discrete subgroup of the isometry group of the symmetric space. And then uh, we want to deform the uh, space X. This means deform the metric the quaternionic Kähler matrix such that it is no longer a homogeneous space, but still quaternionic Kähler and complete. So we want to preserve these nice uh, special geometric properties, but uh, it should no longer be a homogeneous uh, space. So we want to deform it away from the uh, homogeneous example. And then uh, we hope that we can do this in a controlled way such that the deformed space has still a large group of isometries. So one should not deform it in a brutal way, but preserve as much of the symmetries as possible. Uh, and in such a way that we have a large group G of isometries and that this group still uh, has a lattice, uh, gamma. So gamma def uh, is a lattice in the group G, which acts on the deformed space. And so a large group could mean, for instance, that it acts with cohomogeneity one, uh, this means that the orbits are hypersurfaces, so of co-dimension one, and the orbit space is one-dimensional. And uh, let us assume that the orbit space is, a real, is diffeomorphic to the real line. In fact, it can be proven that it must be uh, diffeomorphic to the real line. And then uh, we will also um, hope that we can find the lattice gamma def, which is uh, co-compact in the group G. Then in this very special situation, uh, the, the quotient of the deformed uh, quaternionic Keller manifold X def by the lattice gamma def in the group G 
is a manifold which has a cylindrical shape. So it's topologically, it's a, it's a, a cylinder product of a real line with some manifold, in fact, a compact manifold, and it has precisely two ends, uh, which correspond to the two ends of the real line. And so then we are left with the problem of computing the volume of the ends. So if we find that uh, one of the ends has finite volume, then we have succeeded in finding an example um, with an end of finite volume. So this is the this is a very naive uh, idea, but it turns out that it really works. If you do all um, right and choose the right spaces, then you can really perform all these steps. Okay, so this is the series of examples with which we start. So we take this uh, quaternion Keller uh, symmetric spaces. So this series is a dual to the space of, um, to, to the complex Grassmannians of two planes in the complex uh, space of dimension M plus two, which is one of the compact uh, symmetric spaces, which are quaternion Keller, and this one is non-compact. And uh, in fact, this series is privileged in some sense because it's the only, uh, Together with the compact tools, is the, these are the only ones which are at the same time Kähler and Cotagnone Kähler. So typically, these two properties uh, are not consistent, but in this case, for this series, um, it has the same uh, both properties. It's a Kähler uh, manifold for some complex structure, and at the same time, it is Cotagnone Kähler. And moreover, it is a, an example of what is known as a C map space. So there's an uh, old construction going back to Ferrara and uh, Sapaval, where they write down some general metric from dimensional reduction of supergravity. And uh, these type of metrics have a one loop deformation, which was described by uh, Robert Jana, Sauer, Essig, and Van Doren back in 2006, uh, generalizing results which were previously found for the universal hypermultiplet in four dimensions by Antoniadis, Minasian, Tyson, and Van Hove. So this means that we not only have a symmetric space, uh, we already have a candidate for the deformation. So this is the uh, candidate. And uh, of course, for a mathematician, it's interesting to understand why this metric is got a unique without invoking supersymmetry. And in fact, we, in the study of this type of metrics, uh, we have found that there's a geometric construction uh, providing a proof that these one loop deformations are uh, always, of uh, CMAP spaces, are always quaternion Kähler. So, this is joint work with Alexievsky and Mohaupt and also with uh, Dickmans. And it relies on a um, relation between hyperkähler geometry and quaternion Kähler geometry, which is known as the HKQK correspondence. So, this goes back to Andre Heides, this idea, but he studied. Um, Originally, only positive definite hyperkähler manifolds and positive definite quaternion Kähler manifolds. And to obtain the C map and its one loop deformation, you need to allow indefinite uh, hyperkähler manifolds. And then you need to control the signs of various functions to get the quaternion Kähler manifold in the end a positive definite. So you start with an indefinite hyperkähler manifold, but you obtain a positive definite quaternion Kähler manifold. And in this way, you can obtain the C map and its one loop deformation, which proves that, it is, that these spaces are really quaternion Kähler. Uh, so we have one of these properties, which uh, was in this program, which I'm uh, working down now. Uh, so the next property, which I wanted to have is the completeness. And in fact, we know uh, also that these spaces are complete if the uh, one loop parameter is non-negative. So this depends uh, just on the sign of this parameter. If it's uh, zero, we have the undeformed space, the symmetric space, which is of course complete. And uh, if we deform only in positive directions, then it stays complete. So you should not deform in negative directions if you want to complete uh, quaternion Kähler manifold. Yeah, here just for illustration to show you that these metrics are really completely explicit. This is the simplest case in n equal one. Uh, so this means uh, four dimensions. So n is the quaternionic dimension, if you like. This is the explicit metric. So it is not uh, too complicated in real coordinates in R4. And for c equals zero, uh, this uh, metric is the complex hyperbolic plane metric. So we may ask, can one characterize this metric at least in four dimensions? I think it's good to situate the problem uh, to give these characterizations. So in four dimensions, these, uh, this family of metrics can be proven to, to be the only 
uh, complete quaternionic Kähler manifolds with the principal isometric action of the Heisenberg group. So they are characterized by this property. So there are no other uh, quaternionic Kähler manifolds in four dimensions with this property. And more generally, if you allow, uh, instead of quaternionic Kähler, if you allow more generally Einstein, complete Einstein manifolds with the principal isometric action of the Heisenberg group, and then under the additional assumption that you have, uh, in addition to the Heisenberg group and SO2 symmetry, then you get the same uh, result. So these manifolds are also unique in the class of complete Einstein four manifolds with principal isometric Heisenberg action and additional SO2 symmetry. So here's the metric in higher dimensions. So there it turns out that it's useful to um, use complex coordinates. So these Ws here are uh, complex coordinates. Let me first explain what is the manifold on which the metric is defined. So B is the ball in uh, N plus one uh, complex dimensions. So it is here, it's just a ball. And uh, then we have this trivial bundle over the ball where the fiber has dimension N plus complex dimension N plus one. So we have C star and CN. CN here is parameterized by these complex coordinates W, so WA, uh, as you see here, goes from one to N minus one, but then we have also W zero, so in total it's N complex variables. And uh, C star comes from combining this variable rho, which is known as a dilaton, with this axion phi tilde. So this, uh, again, show you see that the metric is fully explicit. And uh, it is, uh, you can consider it as a fiber bundle over the uh, complex hyperbolic space. So the base, the uh, base manifold here, the ball, has the complex hyperbolic uh, metric. So this is the explicit form of a complex hyperbolic uh, metric. And uh, we see here the uh, parameter C appearing. If you put C equals zero, you get the symmetric space with which I started. This is SU2, N modulo maxima compact subgroup. And uh, so uh, I think one question uh, which you can ask is, okay, you wrote now some metric which looks a bit complicated depending on a parameter C, but perhaps this metric is just isometric to the symmetric space. And you have just made some complicated change of coordinates and have not really changed the geometric nature of the manifold. And of course, this is a serious question which you sh should ask for any, whenever you have some uh, solution or some theory or something or some metric, uh, you should ask this question, whether you are, are just writing some uh, known uh, metric in new coordinates and uh, it's only apparently uh, new. But here we can exclude uh, that this is the case. We can uh, prove that this one loop deformation uh, is in fact non-isometric. Uh, so for, if we take the positive parameter, then it is not isometric to the undeformed uh, metric. And the reason is simply that there exists a non-constant uh, scalar valued curvature invariant. So if you have an invariant, uh, then of course it is invariant under any isometry. And if you had an uh, group of isometries acting transitively or even with an open uh, orbit, uh, then um, uh, this would imply that the function is constant, but we have a non-constant curvature invariant. In fact, this uh, scalar curvature uh, invariant is not the Ricci scalar because Ricci scalar is of course constant for Einstein manifold. So instead we take the norm squared of the Riemann tensor. That, that's the invariant which we compute for the series and we show that it is uh, not constant as soon as the parameter is uh, strictly positive. Uh, so excuse me, yeah. so, so I would say not being homogeneous does not necessarily mean that there is no isometry. No, no, I'm not uh, saying, no, there are many isometries. Oh, okay. There, there so are many the isometries. Still have there, isometry. there, sorry? So they have, they still have isometry. Not yeah, yeah. They, they have many isometries. In fact, cohomogeneity co one group of isometries, but this group is not big enough to be transitive. Oh, okay. It's not Thank big you. enough to have an open orbit. So this means that uh, the manifold is everywhere locally inhomogeneous. So inhomogeneous means that, that there's uh, no transitive group of isometries. And so this is the case even locally everywhere on the manifold. So in particular, this manifold cannot be isometric to the symmetric space, which we deformed. Okay, so this is um, comforting. Uh, so we are on the right track. 
And uh, but still, uh, here in answer to your question, uh, we still have a large group of isometries. In fact, the group which acts with cohomogeneity one. So the orbits of this group are hypersurfaces, but they are not open. So the space is not uh, homogeneous. And uh, we can compute the group. In fact, um, first we computed in this previous uh, theorem, practically the the algebra of the group, and this was big enough to show this uh, cohomogeneity one property. But then, uh, in joint work with Rosa, uh, we even computed explicitly the group, and we showed that the group is closed in the full isometry group of the manifold and has precisely this structure. So it's a semi-direct product of some special unitary group. In fact, here's the universal covering of special unitary group with the Heisenberg group. So we have a natural action of the special unitary group on the uh, Heisenberg group because the Heisenberg group is, cent is a central extension of a symplectic vector space and the SU one N minus one X by symplectic transformation on its defining representation. So in this way, we have such semi-direct product and uh, we have to divide the uh, um, uh, cyclic uh, subgroup, which is diagonally embedded. So th th this is what we find after a, a detailed analysis uh, of the group. So we, we have the group. And now what remains to be discussed uh, in the program, which I announced is uh, uh, lattices in this group. So whether we can find uh, lattices in uh, G. But before I do this, uh, just for illustration, I show you the algebra of killing fields. So they can be, uh, the, I think a short way to, to describe it is as follows. So we consider these complex valued fields and then take the real and imaginary parts and also brackets of those real uh, fields. And this will generate the uh, full uh, algebra SU1 and minus one acting on this um, one loop deformed uh, CMAP space. And the Heisenberg uh, algebra has this very nice uh, and simple form. So again, by taking real and imaginary parts. And in addition, you have to take the partial derivative um, vector field D over D phi tilde, which corresponds to center. And in this way, you get the Heisenberg algebra. And then from this algebra of killing fields, you have to integrate it and find the group. And that's uh, what, what we did. And uh, you may ask whether, whether there are more uh, killing fields. And in fact, there is one additional killing field, uh, which is always there, which enlarges this algebra to U1 n minus one times Heisenberg. So you can replace the special unitary by the uh, uni pseudo unitary uh, algebra. And, uh, but then you cannot enlarge it further, at least not in four dimensions. So in four dimensions, um, we prove that this is the full that the corresponding connected group is the maximal connected group of isometries and the full group of isometries is non-connected and has precisely two connected components. So this is all known now. Uh, and uh, now what about the lattices? So with uh, Rosa and Tung, we show that um, for every dimension, uh, there exists uh, a lattice in the group G. So G was this, uh, essentially a semi-direct product of a pseudo unitary group and the Heisenberg. Group. So there exists always a lattice in this uh, group, such that when you take the quotient of your um, deformed quaternionic Keller manifold by the group gamma, uh, you get topologically a cylinder. Uh, and the fibers of this cylinder are of finite volume. So they depend, of course, on T, uh, since the metric depends on everything. So this are, they are not all isometric, but uh, they are all of finite volume. And uh, you can study the domain where the parameter t in, in this real line is larger than some uh, number t0 or smaller than some t0. And it turns out that the uh, volume uh, of the domain where t is larger than t0 uh, is finite, whereas the volume of the other domain where t is smaller than t0 is uh, infinite. So we have two different types of ends which, which are distinguished uh, by the um, by the volume. In fact, I should not say uh, ends because it, this will be only ends in the technical sense of the term if uh, this cross section K is a compact. And uh, this is the case uh, when N is smaller or equal to two. So in four dimensions and eight dimensions, uh, we show that there exists co-compact lattices gamma. And then this cross section of the cylinder is a compact space. And then uh, we can uh, call these uh, two domains 
the two ends of the uh, manifold, and so one is a finite volume, the other of infinite um, volume. So this is this is um, main result of the work with uh, Rosa and Tung. And so as a corollary, uh, we obtain that, that indeed there exists complete locally inhomogeneous quaternionic Keller manifolds with an end of finite volume in dimensions four and eight. And uh, here I give you the examples. So just to let you see that these are really very nice explicit examples. So to describe the examples, it's convenient to consider instead of the universal covering and the quotient by this diagonally embedded cyclic group, it's convenient to consider just the semi-direct product of the special unitary group and the Heisenberg group. So this is a certain quotient of our group of isometries uh, G, and it acts on a cyclic quotient of our quaternionic Keller manifold, and it has certain nice uh, properties, which I in fact used, for instance, to prove that the group is closed in the full isometry group. We, we use these properties. And then the lattice can be obtained as a semi-direct product of a lattice in the Heisenberg group uh, with a lattice in the special unitary uh, group. And more precisely, in the case n equal one. So for n equal one, you see that this semi-simple part uh, disappears and you have just a three-dimensional Heisenberg group. And so we have just a lattice in the Heisenberg, in the three-dimensional Heisenberg group. This means that our the manifolds, which we have constructed, are just uh, diffeomorphic to a cylinder over a Neil manifold. So this quotient of a three-dimensional Heisenberg group uh, by the lattice the gamma is an example of a Neil manifold. Because Heisenberg group is a Neil potent group. In eight dimensions, the examples are more uh, complicated. So it's not so easy to find co-compact lattices in higher dimensions. And okay, in eight dimensions, we, we succeeded in doing this, uh, but this method doesn't extend to higher dimensions. And there are some obstructions to do this in higher dimensions. So it doesn't work in higher dimensions, but in eight dimensions, it's uh, possible. So here's a construction of a co-compact lattice in SU11 semi-direct product with a five-dimensional Heisenberg group. So you consider uh, a prime number B and a natural number, which is not a square uh, mod B. Uh, and then you can consider the integer span uh, of these uh, three uh, or four matrices. You take the identity matrix and these matrices I, J, and K. So the square of I is A, the square of J is B, and the square of K is minus AB. And so th this type of uh, algebras generated by such type of matrices are known as quaternion algebras. So it's not the standard algebra of quaternions, but it's, simi it's something similar, a similar, uh, it's a similar construction. And we consider this uh, over the integers. Uh, and then the lattice, uh, which we take in SU11 is obtained by intersecting this integer span of these four matrices with the group SU11. And it turns out that this intersection can be described just by the equation determinant A equal to one. And uh, this group, uh, acts uh, co-compactly uh, on the upper half plane. So it's a co-compact Fuchsian group. And moreover, it preserves a lattice in the, the five-dimensional Heisenberg group under the action in the semi-direct product. So it's not only uh, acts co-compactly on the um, uh, symmetric space associated with this semi-simple um, uh, group, but it preserves also a lattice in the Heisenberg group, which means that it is good for our construction. And we can then take this semi-direct product of a lattice in the Heisenberg group and this Fuchsian group, uh, gamma one. And in the construction, it's important to take the one loop parameter uh, in a particular way. So we choose it to be a rational multiple of square root of AB over pi to avoid some non hausdorff uh, quotient. So this is also needed. And so this is, uh, uh, this, these are the uh, examples. Um, so you see there are many such uh, examples uh, in eight dimensions. Uh, so these examples give these uh, manifold, quaternion Keller manifolds of dimension eight uh, with um, two ends and one end, as I said, uh, is a finite uh, volume. So here's uh, some, here are some comments about the computation of the volume. So in fact, we compute the volume density and in, in uh, the above coordinates. And it turns out that the volume density is just the invariant uh, volume density on the orbits. So you have this co-homogeneity one uh, group. 
and uh, there's a uh, on the group uh, there's an okay so on the orbit of this group there's an invariant uh, volume form and this descends to the quotient by the lattice and then the only problem is to study the um, dependence on the remaining variable on the dilaton and this is exactly the expression for the dependence uh, on the dilaton and on the one loop parameter so this is uh, and from this you can deduce what is the total uh, volume of the um, two ends. So for instance, when uh, rho goes uh, to infinity, uh, we see that we can ignore here these two factors and only this first factor is uh, relevant and we can see immediately that the primitive of one over rho to the power in e plus two uh, is given by um, some constant over uh, rho to the power n plus one. So this the volume will be asymptotically uh, of this type, and so it is finite. It's uh, finite. And on the other side, when you go with rho to zero, uh, then um, we have to distinguish two cases because then it's relevant whether the constant c is zero or not. If c is zero, so this corresponds to the symmetric space, uh, we get a divergent uh, volume with a variable rho one uh, going to zero, as, as you see here. And the power is the same as before when we took the other limit for rho to infinity. But uh, when C is different from zero, then you have a jump in the volume growth. So you, you have here much bigger uh, power. Uh, so this distinguishes, so in some sense, this um, quantum correction uh, is, uh, distinguishes the properties of the volume or, the, or you can distinguish the correction by looking at the volume uh, growth along the, uh, along the end of infinite volume. Okay, so now in the second part of the talk or towards the end of the talk, I want to um, discuss some open uh, problems. So just state as an open problem, the first question, I will not discuss it further now. Um, so the que question which I left open is whether there exist complete quaternionic Keller manifolds of dimension larger or equal to 12 uh, with a finite volume end in the technical sense of the term. So such that you have this compact uh, cross section in the construction that are not uh, locally symmetric. So there uh, might be other constructions by which you can get uh, such examples in higher dimensions. So this is, we, don't, we did not solve this problem. And the other question is whether one can use non-perturbative quantum corrections in string theory to construct complete quaternionic Keller manifolds of finite volume. This is a speculative uh, question, but I think it fits well into this conference. And so the state of the art, Please. Um, probably somebody forgot to. Uh, to or somebody to... from meeting room. Is oh, there anybody there, in the meeting room? If not, probably it's good to turn off the speaker in the meeting. Maybe the a host can turn off the speaker. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I, I wanted to say that um, this uh, study of these instanton corrections, I mean, the mathematical study uh, is very complicated. And um, so there are many works um, from physicists uh, exclusively, I, I would say, on, on the um, instanton corrections of uh, quaternionic Kähler metrics. So in particular, Alexander of Pioline and uh, many others. And uh, we are, from mathematics side, we are just starting to understand a little bit uh, of all, all of this uh, picture. So I think there are many uh, technical questions, even to define the metric and so on. This is absolutely not uh, clear, um, let alone to study its properties. So a well-defined quaternionic Keller metric has uh, only been obtained in very special uh, situations. So in particular, there's a paper with Ivan Tully, which I would like to mention, um, building on a previous work of Alexandrov and Banerjee from 2015. So in this, for this special setting of instanton corrections, we can define rigorously a quaternionic Keller metric. And uh, with this method, we obtain a deformation of this finite volume end, which I described uh, in a neighbor. So we have a quaternionic Keller metric, which deforms this um, one loop deformed metric, including these mutually local variations of BPS structure. So these are certain types of instanton corrections, which I will discuss a little bit, explain what they 
mean and the metric is defined in the neighborhood of rho equal infinity. So when this dilaton variable goes to infinity. So it's even not defined on all of the manifold. It's just in the neighborhood of uh, rho equal to infinity. But at least there we can rigorously define the, the metric. Okay, so at the moment we don't know whether uh, such metric can be extended to a complete quaternionic Taylor metric and when the volume of the extended metric is finite. But it's expected from the uh, swampland picture that the volume should become uh, finite after inclusion of all instanton corrections predicted by string the theory if the metric describes an effective field theory consistently coupled to gravity at the quantum level. So there are many ifs here. Okay, so perhaps uh, it is conceivable that one can, uh, by including non-perturbative quantum corrections, in the end, uh, find a way to define a metric of finite uh, volume. Okay, so uh, I would like to explain a little bit uh, the notions which enter in the construction. So I mentioned this variation of BPS structures, uh, which encodes this instanton corrections. So they are basically given by a, a complex, we have a complex manifold and um, a bundle of lattices, roughly speaking, uh, lambda over M, uh, endowed with some skew symmetric uh, pairing and a holomorphic section of the associated uh, complex vector bundle. So this holomorphic section is usually called the central charge in uh, physics. And uh, we have a function omega, um, which is related for instance, with Donalds and Thomas uh, invariants in a certain context, uh, which is just a map which associates with every element in this lattice, some number, and uh, which is symmetric with respect to um, multiplying with minus one and should satisfy the Konsevich Sobelman Wolkhausen formula. In fact, I will not need this formula at all because the special situation which we are considering is a situation where the where there are no walls and no wall crossing. So it's a simplified uh, situation. And then there are some technical conditions. I think now it's too late to go into this technical conditions. So there are some admissibility conditions which ensure that in the end we get convergence for all the expressions. So using these uh, assumptions, we can prove uh, convergence of the, of the metric. And um, yeah, so this mutual locality is very important. It's uh, some, an assumption which we uh, make. So basically uh, we are assuming that the uh, uh, skew uh, pairing is zero on the support of the uh, function omega. So when these BPS indices uh, omega are different from zero, then you always have the pairing equal to zero. And this is a very helpful uh, condition. So this mutual locality implies that there are no walls uh, of marginal stability. So the walls are defined here, they are empty in our setting. And the only remnant of the wall crossing is simply that these functions uh, omega set, on, which are defined uh, on this on the set, the set functions, that they are constant for every local section of the lattice. And in the particular application which we uh, do, uh, this base manifold, this complex manifold is a so-called conical affine special scalar manifold. And the lattice lambda is the lattice invariant under parallel transport under the flat connection of this conical affine special scalar uh, manifold and Z is a very important object in special scalar geometry. It's a, co a conical Calarian Lagrangian section. So in some sense, it is a map which defines the special scalar geometry on M. So which you can use to define the special scalar geometry. And from all this, you in the end, uh, you can extract this metric. So this is the explicit form. I think uh, it is, we have no time to go. <laughs> into the details of all these symbols, but you see that it fits in half a page uh, together with some explanations which uh, cover the rest of the page and a little bit of, of the next page. But instead of explaining all these symbols to you, which would take too long, uh, I would like to explain the main idea of how we obtain this uh, metric and how we prove that it's got a Nikola. In fact, we use the construction in, in joint with Alexievsky, Mohaupt and Dickmans uh, and apply it to an um, indefinite hyperkähler metric, which is written here in very compact form. So this metric already includes the instanton corrections at this hyperkähler uh, level. And then we apply the construction, obtaining a quaternionic uh, metric. 
So what is the structure of the hyperkähler manifold? So you see, uh, this is the hyperkähler manifold. It looks formally almost the same as the so-called rigid CMAP metric, which was introduced by Cicotti, Ferrara, Girardello. So these ignore these factors. These are just to match various conventions in different, of different authors. It's, they are not important at all. So Nij is the imaginary part of the second derivatives of the holomorphic prepotential in the models you know. And um, uh, these W i's are uh, exactly these combinations of the differentials of uh, fiber coordinates, uh, theta in the direction of the tangent um, bundle where we are dividing out the lattice uh, lambda star. And then all of this is deformed. So these n's are deformed to m as it is written here by adding some instanton contributions to the metric matrix. Uh, but also adding instanton contributions to these uh, differentials. And uh, these instanton contributions depend on the variation of BPS structure. I mean, they are written explicitly on the previous page and they include uh, infinite sums and so on and Bessel functions. It is too long to explain the details, but this is the rough uh, structure. And then what we find is that um, we have a rotating killing field for this instanton corrected uh, high, indefinite hyperkähler. How many more minutes do you think you need? Uh, ah, uh, I, am I, I'm already over time. I think uh, I can almost finish uh, with this. I think two minutes will be sufficient. Okay. Is two minutes okay? Sure. Okay, so we find that we have a rotating uh, killing field. It has a very clear geometric origin from the conical affine special killer Manifold, it is uh, Hamiltonian. So we have a Hamiltonian function, uh, which encodes also the instanton corrections. And we find that a certain set uh, where the functions are, have some prescribed sign is uh, non empty. And therefore, we can apply the construction uh, joined with Alexievsky and Mohaupt and can define hyperholomorphic uh, connection, uh, which is part of the construction and uh, obtain in the end the. Um, uh, here's the metric as it appears in the construction. This is the metric. And if you do a direct calculation, inserting all these ex explicit expressions with the instanton corrections, you find the explicit form, which I gave before. So this, this is all what I wanted to present. So thank you for your uh, patience with going a little bit over time. No, not very much, but uh, uh, thank you very much for your very nice, uh, interesting presentation and the result. Uh, so uh, we, we had some uh, questions uh, during the talk and uh, we don't have formally Q&A, but if there is one urgent question and it seems like Mariana as an organizer has one, so please. Yeah, please. I'm please. not sure if it's urgent, but uh, now, can you take this uh, one loop parameter continuously to zero or it's always yes. fixed? Uh, yeah. no, 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 you can no, take no. it continuously to zero and then the isometry type jumps. So in fact, uh, this um, parameter, it's only important whether it's zero or positive. If the precise value is not important. In fact, we can show that any two of these metrics uh, for C positive are isometric. But can you always find the lattice with the, or in order to have a lattice, it needs- No, 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 this, you can, gave this doesn't, the, uh, no, no, this is not possible. And the reason, so now, now I understand right. uh, why you're asking this. So this is not possible. In fact, there is a no-go theorem, if you like. So this um, uh, locally symmetric space, which is compact, cannot be deformed. So we cannot okay. deform yeah. the, uh, the compact space. We can only deform the universal uh, covering. And that's, okay. that's why it's so difficult to get the finite volume. And in fact, we only succeeded in getting an end of finite volume, but not the whole manifold. So it's still open. I see. Now, thank, thank you for your question. Okay, uh, in view of time, probably uh, this is the last, this was the last question. So thank you Vicente again for the very nice talk. You're very welcome. Okay.